Since 2005, we've been housed in the Altamont Community Centre, and this space is made available to us by the City of Sydney, which for many years has been very supportive of the library. So please, I encourage you to pay us a visit, Monday to Friday, between 10 and 3. Um, now, our speaker today is Dr Kate Gleeson. Now, she is a UNSW graduate, uh, but she has also been at Nottingham. And I meant to ask you, and I will ask you afterwards, whether you know somebody I know at Nottingham University. Um, in the UK. She has held prestigious research fellowships in both law and politics at Macquarie University and has served as an executive member of the Australian Political Studies Association. And before going into an academic career, Kate worked at a number of public sector and developmental agencies in Australia and Vietnam. Now, that's all really interesting, <laughs> but... <laughs> One thing that I found really interesting <laughs> was that her statement, inspired by the brave work and tragic death of Aaron Schwartz, I support the free dissemination of academic research in forums such as this, that is referring to the internet forum. I do not support the elitist practices of academic journal publishers. And that's what I thought was really interesting. <laughs> and finally, I think what we're going to hear about today is it's all about what you mean by choice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that's another <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much. I've never had the opportunity to speak here before. I'm really privileged. And as the last talk of the year, um, I've got bad news for you, I'm afraid, <laughs> in the talk. But um, it's, it's, it feels really good to be able to speak in this audience. The last time I came to Town Hall was for Gough Whitman's memorial service. Um, and I just was walking mm. through remembering it. And I still have goosebumps thinking about it. And the, with the topic I'm talking about is abortion politics in Australia, starting from the 1970s till now. And it's just, we've come full circle from the Whitlam years in extraordinary ways that I think no one could have predicted how conservative and drastic things would have become mm -hmm. after that bright moment that everyone had fought so hard for in the 70s. So the, the parallels between Whitlam and Abbott and the timing is not lost on me and being in town hall right now. So this is a, a, a speaking version of a chapter I wrote in response to a lot of discussion around the 2013 election. So there's a lot of analysis in the popular press about what Julie Gillard did wrong or did right. Um, and one of the, the very small things she did do was address a forum of women supporters, and she did mention abortion, and she warned that under an Abbott government, abortion could become a risk. Mm -hmm. And there was all this analysis about whether that had destroyed Gillard's chances. Now, we know that there were many factors undermining Julie Gillard at the time, but what was interesting to me about that discussion was how simple the general commentary was on abortion in politics in Australia. Um, and I wrote, did a lot of research into it to sort of respond to that and explain the histor history of it and the real significance of it and the way that it's understood properly. It's very simple and silly, to be honest. So this is research trying to map the trajectory of what abortion really means in Australian politics more than just people's personal views or their religious views. So yeah. that's the context. So what Gillard did was, in a speech, she warned that under a Tony Abbott government, abortion could become the political plaything of men who think they know better. In response to that, um, Graham Richardson, who just will not shut up, <laughs> has continued offering every piece of unsolicited advice he can against um, Labor Party leaders he does not like. Um, he actually said this was implicated in Gillard's removal from office by her own party. He said it was that, and he said that abortion had not been cited on the Australian political landscape for 10 years. It was a ridiculous statement, and she'd, got just, she'd lost her mind, basically. Um, so that's Graham Richardson's take. We don't have to accept that. But interesting, great, uh, David Marr had done a great deal of research and work looking into Tony Abbott's past and published a quarterly essay um, called The Making of Tony Abbott. Mm -hmm. And it was quite controversial because it dredged up his very ballistic 1970s student politics. But even reading that, Marr glosses over abortion. And he actually ties abortion 
which is interesting because Ma does unearth a lot of Abbott's supposed misogyny and incidents with women, etc. But Ma doesn't get it, in my opinion, and just says, well, abortion is about turning out its Catholic faith. And that's that. And that may be problematic if you don't agree with it, but it's just really about his religion. And then Ma goes on with all this other analysis. Um, in this article, Pay Talk, I want to give the example of abortion as not just being about religious faith in politics. It actually is a plaything of men, and it is quite a symbolic manoeuvring. It's something people trade off. And if you're aware of what's happening in the New South Wales Parliament around Zoe's law, which I could talk to you about in the question time if you're interested, it's not about faith, necessarily. That may motivate some politicians, but it's used as a bargaining chip for people to create wedges, to get what they want, and to force other policies. So I want to look at the example of how Tony Abbott's used abortion politically from the 1970s. So I've looked at his time as a student politician, his time as health minister in the Howard government. Oh, I forgot. And his momentary time as a trainee for lit, uh, priest. Uh, <laughs> don't forget. <laughs> it's only a moment. Um, and in this research shows that abortion has been one of the most significant symbolic issues around which divides of left and right, uh, patriarchal and feminist, have actually been fought in Australia. And people have forgotten that. And because we're not America, and we don't compare to America, and it's not that extreme, it doesn't mean that abortion hasn't been used as a political football in Australia. So in the paper I explain how it has been used as such a divide and wedge people and divide constituents, but also <coughs> quite strategically, it has been used to try and resuscitate policies of adoption, and I'll explain how that has been used. But it's also very intrinsically linked to a question, believe it or not, of student unionism at universities. So there's a big fight in the 70s about student unionism, and I hope to explain how, although it might not be apparent on the surface, abortion is actually related to this idea of breaking student unions. It's strange, I know, but we'll get there. So I started in the 1970s, so why this is a personal mission of Abbott's and also a very political one is, as most people know, he was confronted by an unplanned pregnancy himself in 1976. So Abbott and his partner, 19, 18-year-old, very traditional Catholic families, she finds herself pregnant, Kathy McDonald. Um, Abbott says that they you know, were playing Vatican roulette, in his words, and she found herself pregnant. Um, Abbott offered to marry Kathy McDonald at first, but he retracted the offer when he got cold feet. So um, McDonald went on to have the baby. In 26 July 1977, she called her son John. Um, she spent five days with him. Abbott held him for a moment, um, and then John became one of the 3,867 Australian babies that were adopted in 1977. So this was actually a decline in adoption. By the late 1970s, adoption was very much falling out of favour in Australian policy. This had a lot to do with feminist influence over policy making. Um, and obviously, Whitlam had subsidised the single parents' benefit and abortion had become more freely available. There was a lot less stigma around single parenting and adoption came to be recast as trauma more so than a public service. So trauma afflicted on both men and women, uh, sorry, women and children. But at the time, Kathy McDonald didn't think she had an option, and she said that she was told very forcefully that she had no option but to have that baby adopted. So that is what she did. Now, Abbott, this is documented by Margaret. At the time, Abbott is ascending as a student politician at Sydney Uni. He was a member of the National Civic Council's mm. Democratic Club. So B.A. Santa Maria, who had formed the casual, the, so the NCC evolves out of the Catholic Social Studies movement and that was separate from but very linked to the Democratic Labor Party and it was all, um, the guiding light of this of course was Bia Santa Maria who's a mentor of Abbott's at the time. So the DLP are very famous for campaigning against what they call permissiveness including abortion, homosexual rights, divorce, anti-censorship, etc. They also didn't like immigration and they obviously didn't like communism. Um, the DLP were falling out of favour. So in the double dissolution elections um, in 74 and 75, the DLP basically fell out of electoral relevance at the federal level. And what they did was try to move into university campuses and resurrect their mission at that level because they were no longer relevant at the federal political level. So they set up these democratic clubs. So you know you had the Labor Club, the Liberal Club, and the DLP had their own clubs. So Abbott took over the Democratic Labor Party Club in 1976. Um, he then also took over the Liberal Club. They did a sort of ginger party strategy and they commandeered that at Sydney Uni to make it particularly conservative and Catholic focused. And they, what they were trying to do is get hold of the Student Representative Council. The manifesto that Abbott took to election in 1976 was 
Um, we believe in a society dedicated to peace, justice and freedom. We're opposed to the permissive society because man becomes a slave to his whim and desire and resistant to his ideals. Very classic Santa Maria stuff. So Abbott was trying to get a hold of the Student Representative Council at Sydney Uni, which he managed to do up to um, taking over both the Liberal and the Democratic. And he was elected president of the SRC commencing in 1979. Now, he only held that by a very, very slim margin, and he was <laughs> faced with contest and combat at every turn. And Yay! <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll we like this quote then. Um, he had ongoing and widely ridiculed skirmishes with all the staff that were employed to actually work with him. He, re he repeatedly had to remove, quote, the decorative homosexual feminist and Marxist posters from the office walls, along with the condoms and the notes calling him a fuckwit pinned to his front door. <laughs> He banned gay activists from the SRC front office. Uh, look, his primary agenda in taking over student representative council at Sydney was to end the Australian Union of Students. So I'll explain what that is. Because so he saw the AUS as a front for communism, essentially, which is B.A. Santa Maria's idea. So the AUS was formed in 1970 and it represented all the university uh, and college advanced education students. The students were very wealthy, uh, for relatively. Students paid $2.50 an annual fee, but that meant $700,000 a year budget for the AUS, so it was well funded. And um, it played, just like all the unions did in the 70s, it played a social role in society. Like it ran campaigns for women's liberation, for gay rights, for, uh, for union rights, uh, pro Fredland campaigns in Timor, anti-apartheid campaigns, it was very involved. In. Um, this is post Vietnam, obviously, mostly, but when we were still Vietnam era, um, it was very pro Palestinian, so support of the PLO was very controversial at the time. Um, so the AUS was very much identified as a left wing organisation, and by 1972, its stated aim was a socialist Australia. So it was feared as well, being possibly able to bring that about. And particularly in the, in the. Yes, I know. <laughs> so. Um, the, it all came to a head under, more so under Fraser. So the campaign to destroy the AUS was not just something that Tony Abbott had brought up. So you have uh, Peter Costello doing the same work down at Monash. You have many of the luminaries of the right um, that we know of now as grown men, um, all tied into this agenda to destroy the Australian Union of Students. This relates to B.A. Santa Maria and that worldview that the communists were taking over the universities. And that had been seen to be the case in places like Italy and a little bit in France. And Santa Maria, who did have a very global worldview, Spanish origin, um, could feared that this was a realistic threat in Australia, that the communists would obviously take over the labour movement first, but they would take over the student and the university movement. So it was a quite serious effort to destroy the Australian Union of Students. So Malcolm Fraser was involved. Um, Martin Fraser felt the wrath personally when he went to give a talk at Monash Uni in 1976 and he was locked in the toilets by the students. <laughs> <laughs> and he had to run 50 metres to his car. To, um, yeah, I've actually interviewed a lot of people from this period in the 1970s around student unionism and every single one of them wants to tell me about the time they locked Martin Fraser in the <laughs> <laughs> it, it just wouldn't happen today. The, the student, the politicians are too scared to turn up to any university campus today. You'd never get this fine on a university <laughs> campus. <laughs> anyway, so after that, Fraser took revenge or took precautionary measures. He drafted legislation to try and destroy the Australian Union of Students. So typically, all he could, because of federalism and the way it works, the only university he could directly affect was the Australian National University, which is a very the leading and significant one. So he drafted legislation to allow the ANU to defect from the Australian Union of Students. But his education minister, John Carrick, who is a, a fantastic liberal politician, mm. refused to implement that. So Fraser tried, Carrick said, no, this is a matter for the universities. So what they did, the Lips at the federal level basically withdrew from that assault but let the Tony Abbotts and the Peter Costellos of the world um, take over and try and destroy the union on the ground, essentially. So this matters because it comes up again later in once John Howard gets control of Parliament in 2005, they have a real good go at it. So anyway, so Abbott ascends through his student politician 
uh, life, although this is documented by Ma, he um, goes to the AUS conference in uh, Monash in 1977, and this is when he writes his first journalism piece, and he writes about how this secret conference, and he writes all about how gay it is, and how there's marijuana everywhere, but interesting, he talks about all this propaganda for abortion, and you know, this, this AUS is promoting women's liberation, and gay rights, and abortion, it's all rolled into one for Abbott, marijuana's chucked in, uh, Palestine liberation <laughs> is chucked in as well. Um, and then he sort of exposes it, and he says that this is that this is what is this is undemocratic, and this is a real agenda of the Australian Union of Students. When of course their primary function actually was representing students on campus. They just had, like most unions in the 70s, a more global worldview. Yes. When, when was that in relation to the pregnancy? E, the pregnancy she gave birth. It's within 12 months essentially. So let's have a look. She gave birth on the 26th of July 1977, and his attendance at that conference was, oh, while she's pregnant, March. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it's a, oh, he's very busy. He was a very busy student politician. He would not have time to have a child. And Anne Simons has written about this better than I can, about what, what would have happened if Tony Abbott had, had assumed that paternity and had become a father at 19, and how different his political career might have been, because it's quite hard work to become a working politi- parent and politician. But I let that and Simons has written very well on that. <coughs> Anyhow, so this, there is this threat that the, the right felt from the Australian Union of Students because of all the social um, issues, and David Maher writes a lot about what that's about. It is about communism. But what hasn't been emphasised enough is the significance of abortion. So abortion really got bundled into this for the right as a symbol, weirdly, of communism. And I'll explain why that's weird in a moment. But um, Malcolm Mugridge, if anyone remembers good old Malcolm Mugridge, had a lot to do with this. So, the Catholic Church and other Christians have long warned of the dire ideological excesses of what they call permissiveness, and they bundled everything in together, like I said, gay rights and abortions together and marijuana. Malcolm Muggeridge uh, is a leading international anti-communist, and he founded the British Festival of Light. Uh, he was a Christian convert. His conversion was very dramatic. He told everyone all about it. He toured Australia in 1976, so this is where a lot of inspiration from this time came from. Up to 35,000 people turned out to see Malcolm Muggeridge in 1976. And he talked a lot about the failed promises of the communists in the Soviet bloc, and human, but he tied humanism in with that. And Muggeridge, being a Catholic, was particularly concerned with abortion, and he called it the denial of the very basic responsibilities of life. So when Santa Maria and the uh, DLP and the Tony Abbott's were looking for inspiration, they were kind of guided by Muggeridge's vision. Um, and they talked about abortion being murder, of course, from the Catholic faith, but also associated with godless communism. And Santa Maria actually said abortion was inviting race suicide. So much like we have debates now about whether you know, the Middle East will rise up and win over the West, the big debate at the time was whether godless communists would win, you know, defeat Western liberal democratic ideas. And Santa Maria was very worried about the birth rate. And he actually was so inspired, he writes a lot about how he saw feminism and women's entry into the workforce and the contraceptive pill and abortion, of course, as being the biggest threat to Christianity since the Black Plague, the Black Death. Seriously, this is his words. So it was very much about population, women no longer breeding and reproducing the Christian Western ideal. So all of this motivation is tied up, and that's why abortion was so central to them, why I say, yes, obviously Catholic faith and doctrine is important, but it's much more significant. It was about a clash of civilizations for for this uh, Santa Maria worldview. Now, what they couldn't see was this is ridiculous, because um, abortion in Soviet regimes had been restricted from the 1950s. Um, (coughs) Stalin worked out pretty early on that he needed a large population, and abortion, while it had been very free and liberal and promoted in many Soviet countries from the 30s onward, it wasn't so much so from the 50s. Um, There was great restrictions in some Soviet countries. Um, we all know Romania is probably the biggest example. So it was crazy to call it um, a communist plot. And actually, when we look at who was lobbying for abortion rights in Australia, it was actually civil libertarians more so than the... Um, of course, there was communist women li- lobbying for it as well. But the, the face of the lobbying was civil liberties. So it really was a, a very international and confused view of Santa Maria's to say this is a communist plot. It was a very complex civil liberties issue that, of course, the unions and communist women got behind as well, but not for the reasons that they thought. So in the 1970s, what 
was the decade, I would say, when Australia had the most obviously fraught abortion politics. So we're going through a period of legalisation or decriminalisation or whatever we call it because it's state-based and it's a bit different in every state. But um, so the civil liberties groups had been lobbying for free abortion access since the 60s and they had mainly grown out of humanist type societies. But in the 1970s, the women's liberation movement did transform this idea of abortion from a single civil liberties issue to one that was just tied to women's emancipation and um, liberation. So we had reforms. By 1972 in New South Wales, it was generally understood that doctors could perform abortions in certain circumstances. And the, the demarc point is 1974, because preterm, which is the first feminist abortion clinic, opened and was able to provide abortions for $8 because women had put abortion on Medibank. So even though there's many differences in the states and territories about how legal it was and how hard and easy it was to access, um, for people who feared abortion, 1974 was a scary year for them because it became accessible in a way that it hadn't been. Now, this certainly didn't mean that everyone was happy. The New South Wales Women's Abortion Action Campaign was formed after that point. They were very unhappy with the fact that doctors still had control of women's bodies, and etc. Um, 1973 was the birth of Right to Life in Australia. So they were formed after the, the original lobbying. So it was very contested in the 70s. We had the most serious campaigns fought at the federal level. So after Whitlam had snuck abortion into Medibank, that's when the Right to Life got organised and they tried to decriminalise abortion in the ACT and that's the, uh, the Right to Life got very angry. Um, there was an attempt in 1979 to restrict Medibank funds for abortion. That was country party member Stephen Lusher and that got very close and then... Um, we had the National Women's Advisory Council condemning it. Uh, Bebel Bo, Bebel Bo, Bebel Bo, Bebel Bo Repair, mm. this fantastic woman on this level of the Liberals. Uh, the Women's Liberation Movement obviously protested, and we were very close, but we had a vote in 1979 that allowed us to maintain Medibank funding. So this whole decade, um, a few other things went on. They tried to preclude abortion clinics in the ACT because they could, because it's federal, and tried to keep removing from yeah. So if we've ever had a decade of very clear-cut forward abortion politics, it was the 70s, and it's this time that Abbott's you know, learning his ropes as a politician. So back to the university campuses, all this is going on in the political arena. It's being fought out at uni campuses. So in 1978, the Australian Union of Students held a big meeting at Sydney Uni to take a vote in public about what should be their statement or their policy on abortion. And they had a resolution saying that they supported abortion on demand, and they have a sort of worded in women's liberation language. As long as laws on abortion remain as they are, abortion will be extended to women as a privilege rather than a basic right, and the decision will remain in the hands of judges, doctors, psychiatrists, anyone but the women themselves. So they had a big meeting at Sydney Uni to pass that resolution to say this is what the AUS thinks about abortion. So Tony Abbott addressed that meeting with an anti-abortion politician. Uh, it's written up in the student uh, magazine, Honey Swap. Uh, it's pretty interesting how he's described. I wasn't there, obviously, but this is what's written about him. It says, to hear Tony Abbott speak is to think that he has shares in a baby clothing factory and an adoption agency. <laughs> <laughs> Authoritarian meanness, not even beneficial paternalism, is at its line. He claims to have the right to tell others what they should, whether they should have children. Um, he was also accused of cowardly, anonymously standing in a group, making comments at passing women, um, shouting women, heckling them, basically. So interestingly, the, what, the, what they needed to do in 1978 at Sydney was to vote on whether they accepted this resolution. A thousand votes were recorded, but like student politics is nothing like this now. The campus is empty. But a thousand people turned up to be counted, and what the abbots of the world did was round up their colleges. So, so all the Christian boys came out. And St John's College came out. Um, and their motion was defeated. So 600 to 400 because they had been organised. So they held the vote a week later when it was actually just a normal <laughs> selection of students and it was passed. <laughs> so the 70s was a very fraught time for Abbott. As he's leading the student rep council. He's addressing rallies like that. And he invites Mary Whitehouse to come and speak. Do you remember Mary Whitehouse? <laughs> <laughs> and the, as it was reported, anarchist feminists, I'm not sure who you were, but um, um, attacked them with like cream pies, and it was all very spectacular and fun. So, um, and Abbott was attacked publicly when he invited Mary Whitehouse to speak in 1978. I should point out that the Call to Australia Party, so Fred Niles' party, was started in 1978 as well. This really was a very 
fraught time and so much of that at the beginning for Niall was about abortion. Fred Niall became much more interested in um, anti-homosexual campaigns after the AIDS crisis hit, but initially it was an anti-abortion party, the Call to Australia party. So all of this is going on, and so it's at this time in student politics is really very much about abortion. It's about many things, but it wasn't just an aside, and he obviously had a personal experience around pregnancy. But it wasn't just a personal thing. It was, um, he saw abortion as part of this threat of the left and what he thought was communism at the time. Um, in 1979, the, the most interesting picture I can find, there's graffiti on the Sydney University campus saying, abort Tony Abbott, his mum didn't have a choice. <laughs> this incredibly full time for abortion rights in Australia and it's going on university campuses and most of all Sydney and it's inspired by the DLP, it's inspired by Malcolm Mugridge, etc. So Abbott graduates and he goes off to Oxford Uni um, but then he comes back in 83 and he wants to fulfil his ambition to become a priest and he joins the nation's oldest cemeteries. Uh, cemeteries? Cemeteries? <laughs> I'm actually Catholic. It's just fucking there. <laughs> Seminary. It's kind of weird that it's actually seminary. That's a weird word when you think about it. <laughs> and actually, he found St. Patrick's too gay, is why he didn't like it. He found the homosexual culture there. Um, he, wrote, he busted out of the seminary um, and he wrote an article in the bulletin telling everyone why he left. He's very need for public expression, this man. And interestingly, he found all the empathy among the priests very confusing, and he, yeah, um, and he explained, and he talks like about abortion here as well. So I mean, this why it annoys me a little bit. David Miles' work is wonderful, but it's not hard to find Tony Abbott's trajectory on abortion. So in that article, he explains that one of the examples he found troubling at the seminary was. Um, so, for example, he said when he was at uni, he felt the defend Catholicism in a very hostile environment, which it would have been, though student politics was strong on both sides. And he said that environment he felt more comfortable in because it led him to a, um, a very naturalistic defence of respect for life. And he just understood it really simply when he was at uni. Contraception was wrong because it was part of the me now mentality. Um, abortion was wrong because it violated instinctive respect for life. But then when he went to the priesthood, he found all this, in his own words, nuanced views on morality. And they thought the priesthood had lost its way. And he um, said he was seeking... Isn't it amazing? He was, he was seeking a spiritual and human excellence to which the church is no longer sure she aspires. And he said the same sense of boundless human potential of, of man soaring to God's right hand, which led me to the priesthood, led me away in the end. So... He joined the Liberal Party instead. <laughs> <laughs> and as it happens, the Liberal Party was evolving at this time amazingly to suit his outlook. So I have to cut so much out of this paper, but the transformation of the Liberal Party into being a Catholic party is written about by political scientists as the most significant change in Australian politics in 50 years. So the Chris Publics of the world, the uh, Andrew Peacocks of the world, the John Houston's of the world, etc. obviously don't fit in the Liberal Party. Um, they tried to, you know, this was a time when he... So Abbott joins, he starts working, <coughs> his trajectory is well known, he worked with John Houston and now hates him, like, beyond measure, <laughs> as press secretary. <coughs> Excuse me. But he became friends with John Howard, and John Howard manoeuvred him into oh. public. He won a by-election in a safe seat in 94. And this was when the huge... Uh, the, the Liberal Party went through a profound shift. And why it happened was Jerby Peterson decided to run for Prime Minister. Remember that? Oh. Yeah. And so because Jerby Peterson decided to run for Prime Minister, there had to be a call in the Libs which direction they were going to go. And Howard heard that call. And he said, I can outdo Bjorka Peterson on social conservatism. And that's how it all started. And it pulled the party in that direction. It's not all just fault. There's many other things going on. But, you know, the, the Peter Bournes were booted out or left the party or booted out of the party. Um, the, 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 what I would say was the real liberals left the party over this period. Um, and so Abbott, who was finding the priesthood way too empathetic, and nuanced, <laughs> finds his home in the list. Now, I have to fast forward to his time as health. So he was elected in 94. For 10 years, there wasn't anything much he could say or do around abortion. It wasn't his portfolio. Um, his 
God, he gets his chance and he's made health minister in um, 2004 by uh, Howard. So fast forward to 2004. One of the first things that Abbott uh, did, which is very interesting, one thing made health minister, oh sorry, it was, it was 2003, he was appointed, was he went straight to Adelaide, he was invited to Adelaide Uni. So these, I talk about these democratic clubs, which had been the DLP student clubs. Um, the DLP, after the 80s, was irrelevant, essentially, or uh, well, from the 80s onward. Um, so I think I missed the most important part there because I got so excited talking away. By 1984, the Australian Union of Students was defunct. So what had happened was that they, at campus level, they had withdrawn the, their own support universities one by one had, and led by the Peter Costello and Antonio. And the AUS was defunct. We had the National Union of Students, which came in its place. So they actually succeeded in their mission. But by that time in 1984, um, the... The role of the DLP, etc., was was mostly irrelevant, and we have the whole Hawke era at that stage, which has a whole different relationship with unions anyhow. So the the way unions were understood and acting was different from '84 onward. But um, so what those democratic clubs hadn't really existed from 1979 or 1980 onward. But when Abbott, the timing is extraordinary. So Abbott gets made health minister in 2003, and Adelaide University decides to resurrect its democratic club. It hasn't had one since the '80s, and they ask Abbott to come and give the first speech at the Democratic Club um, reawakening, essentially. And they ask him to speak on the ethical responsibilities of a Christian politician. And they see this as a great revival. And it's very interesting that they think that Abbott being health minister is, is their moment, not him being workplace relations minister, for example, um, which if they were true DLP people, they'd be very interested in labour rights. But they waited until he was health minister to think that this was something that that's how they would identify as Christian politicians in the area of health, which usually means in the area of abortion. So um, Abbott, when he gave a speech, he was back in his glory. He talked a lot about the 1970s, and he saluted and paid tribute to the democratic clubs of the 1970s. He said they were part of a grand coalition of activists which eventually destroyed the far-left union, Australian Union of Students. And he stated that a Christian politician should commit to natural law, um, and he mentioned things like, he just had a random list of things he doesn't like, like embryo experimentation and euthanasia, and abortion. And he included abortion, and he discussed it in terms of the classic 1970s critique about permissiveness, and people not being women, essentially not being responsible for themselves. Um, now, that speech was in March 2004, and it got a lot of attention. It's when people started to remember who Tony Abbott was, I guess, and it's like, okay. So this, what's he doing? There have been a bipartisan consensus in Australian politics since the Hawke era to not talk about abortion at federal level. We had a bipartisan consensus on two things, which was immigration and abortion. And um, this had been as it was. So abortion hadn't been raised in the Australian Parliament since the debate around Human Rights Act, uh, which is the early 80s. And Abbott had broken that consensus. And that had not... We had a few independents who had broken away from, like, Fred Niles' party talk about it, but none of the major parties, it was understood this was not a federal issue for Australian politicians anymore. And that was something that Hawke and um, Peacock, etc., had forged. So Abbott broke that consensus, and people think, what is this about? What's he trying to do? What can he really do at the federal level around abortion? You can certainly tamper with Medibank, and you can make a very difficult culture, but you can't actually attack state laws so much. Um, but what actually we look back and now analyse what was going on. So the 2004 election was seen as the apex of Christian influence or religious church influence on Australian politics that we hadn't really seen before in Australia. It was the birth of the Family First Party, for example, and there was um, a lot more talk around the role of the church as the Australian Christian lobby became very prominent. Um, but what Abbott also did in that speech was chastise the religious leaders um, for being compassionate around refugees. So he, yeah, so he was actually able to say, he was calling to the churches to say, you should be concerned about abortion, that's your job. Would you please stop telling us about workplace relations and refugees? That's our job, we're politicians. So there was a lot going on in that. It was trying to have a public relationship with the churches who they wanted on side, but they wanted to put the churches in their place, and they didn't think commenting on, this is not long after the Tampa expedition, right? So when Abbott, um, he, in, from 2004 to 2005, over the year, he made repeated calls to church leaders publicly to take the lead in progressive and anti-abortion debate. He said, this is your responsibility. And when he did, he kept to his 1970s language. So he talked about abortion in terms of a national interest. 
He called it a national tragedy and a stain on our national character. So this was Santa Maria's ideas about race suicide and what would happen to the country if women didn't keep having lots of black children, etc. Now this was a very dangerous time in Australian abortion politics. A number of conservative politicians like Chris Pine, but um, columnists like Miranda Devine got really invigorated by this. Um, Anti-abortion lobbies formed at the time and the Ann Summers called, called this a growing hysteria about the decline in the birth rate at this time, which there was a lot of talk about that. So Peter Costello was also encouraging us to have one for the oh, yes. husband, yes, at the same time, one for our husbands, one for ourselves and one for the family. So it was thought about in terms of the nation, which I guess is my point too, that there is a lot of religious and individual personal motivation among politicians, but they're talking on national terms about many things at once. Um, the, so Dana Bale, who's now no longer in Parliament, <laughs> came out with like the exemplar, like I'm not exaggerating, she came out with the, the amazing comment in 2006, all buoyed up by Abbott, that Australia could become a Muslim nation within 50 years because we are avoiding ourselves almost out of existence. <laughs> oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> yeah, so it was racial as well, as much as um, the... So the facts are that Australian abortion rates, as far as we know, have stayed on par since the 1970s. So we've collected data in South Australia since 1969. Abortion ratio has barely changed. Um, they're probably similar to before the legalisation of the 1960s. We're on par, basically, with the countries that are comparable to us, New Zealand, UK. Um, we're lower than the USA, where they have very <coughs> poor sex education. So you know, our abortion rate hasn't gone up or gone down. It hasn't gotten worse. It's, it's, not, it's, not, a, it's not an aberration in the world by any means. Um, still, the, if you look at the Adelaide Democratic Club's website, the students who invited Abbott, they continue to praise themselves as proud to have hosted Abbott's now famous speech concerning Australia's high abortion rate. And Abbott has said himself that putting abortion back on the national agenda and producing a new consensus that the abortion rate is far too high, some of his greatest achievements as health minister. So he's not been shy about this um, uh, until he had to become shy about it when he thought maybe he could be Prime Minister. So what the Howard government did, I think, what can they do at the federal level? They did a few things that to mainly, actually, weirdly, not appease Tony Abbott, but to appease Brian Harrodin, who was head of the House of Power for three years. So we were not able to import the drug RD486 for quite some time, I'm sure you're all familiar with that, when it had been available in America and Europe for years. Uh, that was a Brian Harrodine favour. And what we did was we followed the Americans, the, the Republicans, and we stopped funding family yeah. planning and abortion yeah. services overseas in our aid program. And that did include family planning, it wasn't just abortion. So that was really significant federal measures. But these actually weren't connected to Tony Abbott, and they're done quite quietly. Like the average Australian didn't know about the area for six years later. Um, but what I, so that's a private, like what is, what goes on at the political level is the quiet things that happen which are very frightening. But then there's all this blustering and guff and saying, well, what is Tony Abbott doing? He wasn't really trying to get those measures. He was trying to create uh, a discourse and a culture around anti-abortionism. And one of the things that's been overlooked at the time is not just that you know, he's opposed to abortion and he wants to make it hard for women and abortionists. But what was also going on at the time, which most people don't think about or don't link, was what the Howard government tried to do was to resuscitate and rehabilitate the practice of adoption at this time as a public good. Now, bizarrely, this happened to coincide. No one could have seen this one coming. Um, Tony Abbott's relinquished son reappeared in the middle of all of this, which if it could have been scripted, it would have... <laughs> no one would have believed this on a TV show, I have to say. So... Um, I'll explain adoption just quickly. As I said, by the 1970s, it's very much falling out of favour, um, particularly since it's the Stolen Children's Generations Report, so that's 97, bringing them home. But also New South Wales had an investigation into um, non-Indigenous practices, or just general population practices, called Releasing the Past. That report found that New South Wales adoption practice had been misguided, sometimes unethical, and on occasion illegal. And we've had apologies lately to the Forgotten Australians and to... Um, <coughs> to women who had had forced adoptions or very dodgy adoptions where they were ill-advised about what was actually happening to them. So coming in that context, adoption had been really mostly beyond recuperation and resuscitation in Australia. It was more this understanding of how bad the past practices had been, how many women had been lied to and abused in that context. And no one had tried to rehabilitate adoption at the federal level since the 70s as a public policy good. 
But in March, in 2005, what happens is Howard gets both houses of Parliament, and that's how we get work choices, and that's how we get rid of John Howard in the end. But they were very confident by 2005. This is like a third-term government who is just thinks it can do anything, and is very um, just full steam ahead with its ideological agenda. So in, in the midst of all the things we know about, like work choices, um, in March 2005, Tasmanian Liberal member Michael Ferguson call for an inquiry into overseas adoption. That was where they first thought they could start talking about adoption, was overseas adoption. Um, Michael Ferguson was an, uh, an advisor in his past life to a very well-known anti-abortion campaigner, Senator Guy Barnett, who's no longer in Parliament. Um, so it's the anti-abortionists who tend to be most interested in talking about adoption. So what they thought they could do is have an inquiry into overseas adoption, because um, it is true that Adoption generally in the domestic population is very, very minimal. And if there are adoptions taking place in Australia, uh, I think 65 percent or so come from overseas. So we have this inquiry slowly going on, run by conservative politicians into overseas adoption, which is probably tied somehow to not the, the best view of adoption, I would say. I think it's tied to some form of anti-abortion agenda. And then suddenly in that period, um, at some of his and... Um, he had contacted Abbott around Christmas time. His name was now Daniel, and he wanted to make contact with him. So Daniel had contacted his mother when he turned 18. His mother had told him who his father was, and he waited a little while. He was quite shocked by who his father was. <laughs> he actually was a cameraman who worked in our apartment house, so he'd actually been in the same building as Abbott, so he was really quite shocked. <laughs> um, Abbott leaked the news to Piers Ackerman, his sympathetic journalist, so it all had a very heartwarming and fuzzy feel. <laughs> Um, and it was all very this story about uh, reunion and homecoming. And interesting again how Alex described, described it. He said, It's amazing this has happened in the middle of an abortion debate. Oh, I don't want Daniel to become a political football in the abortion debate. But I will tell you that his first words to me were, Thank you for having me. Oh. Oh. Adoption services reported that they actually were flooded at the time with inquiries. It's such a high-profile adoption story. We don't see so many private adoption stories happening every day, but to have a high-profile one is extraordinary. Um, and adoption services were flooded with inquiries, and people were very, you know, wanting to make contact, etc., with the past families. Um, and again, Abbott goes to the bulletin and writes about his life, and he says that it's a great relief to him that his son's attitude was not resentment at being given up for adoption, but gratitude at being given his chance at life. And he said, I'm very disappointed so few babies are adopted um, because there are plenty of parents willing to adopt them. And then Dana Vale calls for an inquiry, not into adoption, an inquiry into abortion because she says that these two things are connected and that we need to have, we need to have adoption, not abortion. Um, then I'm sure many of you know, it turns out it's actually not Abbott's child. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is extraordinary a moment in Australia. It's like so poor, 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 poor everyone. Poor Daniel, poor Kathy. Um, yes, what had happened was the actual father of Daniel saw Daniel on television and thought, that child looks like my son. <laughs> and well, Kathy had, had many friends and partners in her time in the 70s, as we all do. And this was a friend of Kathy's in the 70s, and they had obviously slept together. And, Kathy, they had a DNA test and confirmed that yes, it wasn't Abbott. So Abbott had gone through his massive public, um, <laughs> written in the bulletin, um, you know, disclosed all this personal information about his son, about his words, about not wanting to be aborted, and you know, he was seeing at the same time he doesn't want him to be used to football, and the poor child, who's now an adult, um, didn't need to have been put through that, is all we can say. But that's not, that's not what's fault, I suppose. Anyway, so this is all playing out, and what people are not paying attention to is what is going on at the federal level. So everyone's just like starstruck that this could be going on in Australian politics, because our politics is usually fairly personally boring compared to the Brits and the Americans, <laughs> who have lots of scandals. Um, that inquiry is going on to overseas adoption, and yes, uh, Bronwyn Bishop chairs it, it's run all by conservatives, um, and they want to look at what are the inconsistencies, how to free up, I mean it doesn't sound that pernicious and suspicious, overseas adoption is, is a good for some people, but in the context that it was, and that it was conservatives who were running it, as, and the fact that Dana Vale is explicitly tying adoption to abortion it is important to keep in mind. So what they found is that they should, it is quite hard to uh, go through an overseas adoption process and we need standardisation of um, regulations and we need to make it easier. But Chairwoman Bronwyn Bishop revealed her ignorance and surprise, so she announces the committee's findings, which is basically that we should make overseas adoption easier. 
and she said she's very ignorant and surprised to learn that adoption is viewed negatively by health professionals and social workers. Um, she just had sort of missed that entire discourse and was, didn't understand why adoption wasn't as common as it used to be in the 60s. So this whole... My argument is that there's many things Abbott was trying to do with abortion in 2004, but the resuscitation adoption is one. But this is not the end of the story. There's another bizarre twist that happened in 2005 when Parliament looked a bit more like 1975 than it did. Um, so as I said, when Howard got control of both house, houses of Parliament, the third term, it was a very ideological agenda. He'd done his you know, initial economic reforms, the GST obviously was a very hard one. In the second term, it was more about the refugee issues and then by the last third term it was what can we do domestically to really imprint and change this nation and work choices is obviously the, the most fundamental. But what else he did was he set about finalising another long-term ideological agenda and that was to get rid of compulsory student unionism. So Fraser had tried that as I, as I told you in 1977 but John Carrick balked it and refused and then as I said the student politicians managed to withdraw themselves from the Australian Union of Students themselves but they never got rid of compulsory student unionism so that means that when you went to uni you paid some fees and that supported your student union and that gives you services like subsidised food, subsidised housing etc but it had always been an ideological agenda of the Libs since Fraser's time to somehow get rid of the compulsory element they don't like compulsory unionism in any context obviously they could never do it but then as I said they were really buffed up in 2005. So Brendan Nelson, remember him, <laughs> Education Minister, introduced the first, it's a big, it's called VSU, Voluntary Student Unionism, introduced the first voluntary student unionism bill um, that we've seen since 1977 to end compulsory student unionism as pertaining to the National Union of Students, so that was the one that came after the AUS. As I said, while well, Fraser could not muster the numbers to pursue this in 77, Nelson had the support of what um, Kim Beasley called his revenge of the nerds because he didn't like the student politicians he used to have to mix with 20 years ago. So a lot of them were bringing their old adversaries to think. Now, the VSU bill was very unclear and the, it was, the fate of the bill was unknown. And it was one of the few dramatic moments in Australian politics where until they counted the numbers on the floor of the House of Reps, um, sorry, in the Senate, uh, we didn't know how the bill was going to fall. It was so tight. This is because the Nationals didn't support it, because they are in regional areas. Their regional universities would have suffered from uh, voluntary student unionism. They saw this as particularly at Armidale, so UNE and Chester Uni. Yeah, so Barnaby Joyce crossed the floor and refused to support the bill. Um, yes, interesting, um, because then the regional unions need that money. And so no one knew how the bill was going to go because they didn't have the NAT support. So in the final dramatic moments, the casting vote had to be taken. And who steps forward out of the abyss to secure it is Family First Senator Steve Fielding. When he was elected and not nine months earlier, he declared his interest immediately in pursuing anti-abortion policies of pregnancy counselling, anti-abortion pregnancy counselling, and uh, scan, scans of what he called these unborn children. Those are his two demands. That if you needed a termination, you would have to have a, uh, an ultrasound. Now, everyone held, like journalists and ALP and political commentators like me, held very deep suspicions that Fielding had done a deal. Like, why would Fielding sell out student unions in particular, like, when people like Barnaby Joyce could even see that it's bad for families, bad for communities, etc. Um, but Steve Fielding did, because he voted with the government, and that's how they ended compulsory student unions in Australia after, since 1977, trying. Um, within... Oh, six months later, Howard is standing next to Abbott and he announces $51 million in anti-abortion pregnancy counselling. And everyone pretty much thinks that this was Steve Fielding's deal, essentially, were to end compulsory student unionism. Suddenly we had anti-abortion pregnancy counselling in Australia for the first time. So this idea that abortion is a political plaything of men that is traded uh, is, is very much apparent, I think, and it is something that... Some politicians, such as the Family First Party or the Fred Nile called Australia Party, um, is very dear to their hearts and their votes become crucial. Obviously, Brian Harrodin is another great example of that. The power of abortion is not just a matter of someone like Tony Abbott's personal faith. It is, it's a trading, it's a football for politicians. So after that, 2005, we fast forward 
uh, that miraculously wins the leadership of the Liberal Party by one vote because Joe Hockey didn't vote because he was sulking. Uh, we know now Joe Hockey didn't vote because it's in his autobiography. So if Joe Hockey had voted, we would have had Turnbull. Um, ever since Abbott became leader, he miraculously softened his stance. I've actually met Tony Abbott and been asked to debate him on abortion. He's told me he doesn't know what I'm talking about. He said Tony Abbott concerned for women's wellbeing. Yeah. Oh. Uh, it's all been a big. Um, oh, it was never that big a deal. Just a couple of moments of speech. You know, um, he's very much pulled himself away from documented comments, documented a lifelong of documented comments. Um, what happens then is we get Rudd in. Uh, Rudd reversed the uh, overseas anti-abortion measures, so the stuff on Jose and family planning gets reversed under Rudd. Rudd reverses the anti-abortion pregnancy counselling, or at least makes it um, real pregnancy counselling, so that people are given honest options, including abortion. Uh, Rudd also passed legislation to bring back some version of compulsory student unionism. So this is this pendulum of as much as we have left and right left in Australia, which we don't so much. These were immediate concerns for us, so we go back to some form of compulsory student unionism. We get rid of the anti-abortion stuff. But what is weird is 2010 was also the year that the DLP returned to Australian politics for the first time since 1974. <laughs> no one thought they would. John Madigan ran as a senator a candidate, the last on the ticket basically, and he won a primary vote of 2.3 percent, and he found himself in the Senate. <laughs> So he used his maiden speech immediately to resuscitate the DLP mission on abortion. He described the Victorian abortion laws, which are quite progressive, as the most inhumane laws ever passed in this country. The only bill John Madigan has ever put up to the parliament is a, an attempt to restrict Medicare funding for abortion. He's called it um, a concern about gender selection abortions. He has decided that there is this process in Australia where people are bought based on the sex of their baby fetus when there's no evidence that actually occurs in Australia. Um, so this is John Madigan's. So we, um, again, we have to think about this in terms of deals and what what is it, you know, John Madigan is promising to his constituents, all 2.3% of them. Um, but it's, it's an issue that's never going away. So the Senate committee reported on Madigan's bill saying, well, there's no evidence that there's gender selection abortions. But that bill still could be tabled. It waits to be tabled. And what was very frightening was in the 2013 election, neither of the major parties would issue a statement on that bill. We couldn't get Tanya Pivasek to say anything about that. It was just, let's just get elected. So even when Gillard, you know, quite sensibly, said, under a Tony Abbott government, abortion could become the political plaything of men. There's a Madigan bill sitting in the Senate waiting to be debated. Um, this is being dismissed as hysteria and don't be crazy. When, you know, this is actually all very real. So I think I've talked forever. Um, I go on forever about this. But that is this, my general takeaway is clearly people's religious and personal motivations are real and are to be respected and, and understood. But there's this Graham Richardson analysis that abortion isn't something that is used politically, is, is silly. And David Maher has been too confident to overlook the, the long-standing way that this has been used. And as I said, what's happening now is these lobbies tend to, we call venue shopping, they move between the federal and the states, and most of the anti-abortion activity now is at the state level. So we've got activity um, in New South Wales at the moment, but also the Victorian election is on Saturday, and the DLP are running there, uh, quite involved by Madigan, I guess, on an explicit anti-abortion campaign. So they, it's, it's not a fantasy of Julia Gillard's that this is still a problem. Thank you. Yeah. I think David Maher stole my thunder. Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. Um, regarding uh, 
by John Madigan and the DLP. I read in today's paper when they were referring to Jackie Lambie, yes. the yes. PUP, that Madigan has left the DLP. Oh. He's become an independent, apparently, yes. in this new yes. vote. Gosh, help us. And there's a high court challenge as to whether that seat belongs to the party oh, wow. or belongs to him. Mm -hmm. That'll be yes. interesting to say. Uh, Kate, would you like to just give a quick comment on Abbott uh, bringing up the overseas adoption matter again with um, mm -hmm. Hugh Jackman? Hugh Jackman. It is the way that constantly, like I said, Abbott's a great character, great character to look at because he's become much more sophisticated and civilised since the 1970s when he could just say straight up that abortion's murder and women are all murderers and bad. And the, the nuance of the way the argument has to be framed has had to change and become so much more civilised and sophisticated over time. But it is extraordinary. So the, I have always seen that overseas adoption thing as intrinsically connected to an anti-abortion policy. But the timing is very, very silly on his part because there is so much rightful concern about surrogacy at the moment and we do not know the conditions of overseas adoption as much as we should and if I don't, I don't think he's understanding that those things are, in a sensible person's mind are quite connected it's very hard to know with overseas adoption the reputable nature of the agency and if the child is actually an orphan if there could be any family member who could want to you know, sustain that child in that country and it's, it's a, bit, he's a bit silly in his timing I think it is this only way you can resuscitate adoption and you can't, he can't really talk about abortion anymore, but he'll always find some way to talk about this, the way he wants to configure nuclear families and the way that they must be nuclear and they must have... And it, overseas adoption seems like a safe terrain because, obviously, many people can have sympathy for overseas adoption. But right now, when surrogacy has proved to be so risky and you know, open to abuse, it won't be long before overseas adoption will, should be analysed, at least in a press like that. So I, I, I think it's silly timing on his part. Well, can I just say thank you so much? You gave so much. <laughs>